Welcome back to Weekend Agenda. Time now for our regular Saturday panel. That is Ben Oakless from the Australia Institute and Simon Breeny from the Institute of Public Affairs. Now, Simon, I notice you've got that Melbourne Cup pin. I believe you're out at uh, Derby Day at Flemington. Did you win? Yes. Uh, yeah, you've called me in from uh, Flemington Racecourse today. <laughs> it was a beautiful day out there. As expected, the weather wasn't going to be quite as good as it turned out to be. So, uh, beautiful day and uh, great to see some people having some wins today. That's not to say I had some losses, but uh, I wasn't placing any bets today. So, I feel like I'm up overall. Yeah, and I don't know about, Ben, whether you were watching things from afar, but there is one thing I will say about that Melbourne Cup pin at uh, my daughter's school earlier in the week. I not only met Jimmy Cassidy, the pumper, but also saw the Melbourne Cup, all $200,000 worth of it, brought in to show the kids. And the pumper, now 55 years old, uh, singled out a uh, small kid, uh, Down syndrome kid, who's at my daughter's school, got the pin went through the crowd and gave it to him, which I thought was an extraordinary gesture and does point to some of the human aspects of this, uh, this uh, carnival of horse flesh. Speaking of carnivals of horse flesh, uh, the big question of the week, I guess, uh, Ben Oakwist and, and, uh, and Simon, is to audit or not to audit? Uh, whatever the value, my view is that public opinion is moving so rapidly away from Malcolm Turnbull that it's going to be very hard for him to resist in the end, Simon? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many aspects to this, but one of the really interesting um, parts of it is th there's really no function that's given to any government agency to carry out an audit of the kind that would be required here. So. Some people have mentioned the AEC. Um, I'm not sure that it's really clear that the AEC has the powers that would be required. One of the issues that Malcolm Turnbull pointed to this week is that there is no way to compel members of parliament to produce the kind of documentation that might be required to prove uh, whether or not some of these members of parliament do have these citizenships or don't. Um, and really, I think the only way to get around this um, is to have a Royal Commission with a very, very limited terms of reference. I can't see that there's any other way for the government to get through this um, if they do decide to go down this path of having an audit. I, I think that having an audit in principle is a good idea, but um, given that there are those quite serious practical considerations, I'm not sure um, really how, how they would actually carry it out. Ben, uh, a Royal Commission, wonder how that would go down. The government's been fending off a Royal Commission into the banks, now having won into uh, what really, as far as the public is concerned, the failure to do and carry out their duty of care. Well, it, it, it is difficult. It's really difficult to know what to do. And I kind of, I don't see it so much through the partisan lens. This is a, a constitutional mess that really is affecting all sides of politics and is now affecting, I think, very much the public's uh, faith in our parliamentary system to make decisions, and that's a terrible state of affairs. I don't, I don't really blame any one side of politics for it. It's, uh, to put it bluntly, a wretched constitution, and the High Court well, like, has well, read judgment. it in has read it has read it in a brutal way um, and I think it's the Constitution that is at fault and I think ultimately in the end the Constitution's got to be fixed and I had some sympathy for Frydenberg this week um, and those who defended him. I've saying, got a lot of ridiculous. sympathy for Frydenberg, no doubt about it. Yeah exactly, how ridiculous that his um, citizenship status would be questioned after what his family went through but I actually don't think it was an illegitimate question to be asked and to be debated because of the brutal. I'm sorry way to interrupt, Ben, because but it's interesting to it was interesting to see that uh, Alex Somley, former Liberal member mm. for Fairfax, when this first came up after the Sykes uh, and uh, a, a, a Cleary case in 1992, Liberal mm. MPs at the time were asked by Peter Costello to check on these things. Alex Somley, who'd come to Australia as a stateless person from Hungary in 1949, was advised by the then uh, ambassador from Hungary that there were prospective changes to the Hungarian law and that he 
might want to look into his status. He decided protectively that uh, he should formally renounce any, any entitlement to Hungarian citizenship. And that's the mess that this decision and Section 44 of the Constitution have got us into. Exactly. Ben? And so while, while I've got massive sympathy for Frydenberg, I, I, I do have some sympathy for those who are questioning whether he would forfail the Constitution. It was a legitimate question to ask because um, that's our Constitution and that's the way it's been read. It's undoubtedly that there would have been past MPs in many parliaments who would have fallen foul of that section of the Constitution if it had been tested. Now, ultimately, the only solution is, I think, a referendum to fix that Constitution. Of course, there are short-term problems for the government and there are short-term problems for our body politic, but in the end, I think we're going to have to come to, the, come to groups with, I think, the need to change that section of the Constitution. I know everyone says it's politically impossible, it's politicians looking after themselves. What about Indigenous recognition? Um, uh, but the fact that Frydenberg, if there's, the fact that there's any question that he might fall foul of it, to me says that section needs to be changed. But I think, though, the, the most devastating development um, of recent time was Bill Shorten today um, throwing it back on the Prime Minister to say, well, you demanded that I put up or shut up, and I did. So now it's your turn to put up or shut up. I, I did think that was a, a, a devastating performance by Bill Shorten today, and it puts the pressure back on the Prime Minister. I don't know what the circuit breaker can, him, can be. The audit has problems, of course. In the end, it's only the High Court that can actually determine whether you fall foul of that um, section of the Constitution or not, but there does need to be some circuit breaker. My advice to the Prime Minister would chart a long-term course um, to start building the case for a referendum to change Section 44, and not just for dual citizenship, but I think the Office of Profit um, change needs to be made too that affects all sorts of public servants. Some breaking news. On Channel 10 from Hugh Rubinton, I see that Barry O'Sullivan, uh, O'Sullivan that very controversial Queensland uh, senator is in trouble, is in more trouble um, under that section of the Constitution and potentially offers the profit section and his businesses allegedly bene benefiting from government contracts involving federal money. So I, I, think, I think there's more problems on the horizon for the government and, and Turnbull needs to find some circuit breaker um, to get out of this mess. I do wonder, in light of what Ben uh, is saying, Simon, whether with things, if it is the case about Barry O'Sullivan, this just makes matters worse and I would have thought, given the public mood, renders even more difficult the prospect for constitutional change on this specific issue of Section 44. Um, yeah, look, uh, I mean, it, it, the, the real problem for, for the government at the moment is that there's, there's, there really is no circuit breaker. So even if they go down the path of saying, well, we're going to have an audit into the citizenship issues, I mean, the Barry O'Sullivan thing is to do with the Office of Profit, which mm. is another part of Section 44. The, the dual citizenship issues, of course, um, have been going on at the same time as there have been a number of other Section 44 cases that have been on foot. Um, but even on the citizenship issue, I don't think that a, an audit is going to, to stop this from happening. It's not really going to cauterise the wound. The only way for this to, to stop is for um, journalists to stop being interested in it, for members of the public to stop being interested in it, because I think really there's no end to the questions that could potentially be asked of so many members of parliament who, if they themselves weren't born overseas, their parents may have been or their grandparents, um, there are questions about citizenship laws which um, offer citizenship opportunities to people, um, entitlements to people that they may or not, may not take up. Um, so there are just so many of these sorts of questions, but so many of these questions of course have been raised because of the judgment that's been handed down by the High Court. And um, I think really the, the fundamental problem here is, is not Section 44. Section 44 is relatively clear and if you go back to um, the time that the Constitution was being debated, no one was considering seriously a dual citizenship scenario which is really a, a, a modern creation of uh, these people who haven't done anything to take an oath of allegiance, which is what the Founding Fathers saw as... Yeah, and ironically, Simon, think. this is designed to be of benefit 
to those people who find themselves in this situation rather than the opposite. And in a sense, it's almost a function of the globalised world in which we live. Yeah, I, th I, think that, I think that's a really good point. There's a terrific article that will come out this week by a colleague of mine, Morgan Begg, who is talking about exactly this argument and why the rot really started in 1992 with that judgment uh, and has now continued on because the president's been followed in the most recent citizenship cases. Look, it's also the case, I was rereading the Citizenship 7 uh, decision, all 44 pages of it today, and clause by clause, sentence by sentence, it's littered with what are in effect warnings to people who want to be members of parliament who, or who are members of parliament that you have to be extraordinarily prudent, extraordinarily careful, have to go back uh, a, a long, long way. Ignorance is certainly no defence and so in a sense they've almost made a rod for their own back because it inevitably means I would have thought that there are going to, on the basis of that judgement, there are going to be more and more cases where at least questions are going to be asked because they let off uh, Matt Canavan, they let off uh, Nick Xenophon uh, on the basis that it couldn't reasonably be expected that they would know in, ad infinitum that they, uh, in the case of Matt Canavan, that he might have had Italian citizenship and that there were no benefits conferred on Nick Xenophon, but they were much uh, more stringent about uh, all the others. This is a, a, going to be a really difficult thing uh, to get through and I, you know, it may be uh, that a referendum is the answer, but uh, Ben Oakquist, uh, a referendum, a royal commission, with the government, with its current standing, this is going to be very difficult indeed. It, it is, and referendums are difficult. But I just, I just think it's worth just thinking about the long term slightly. Um, whatever you think of the decision, whatever you think of the constitution, we've got it. The High Court decision has been made, and now we have to think long term as well as get ourselves out of this political mess. And, uh, and unfortunately, if we see it just through the partisan prism of who's done what right and wrong, we won't find the, the better solution that's going to uh, fix it for all sides of politics. And uh, Labor hasn't been embroiled in the same way as the Coalition, but there have been question marks over some of, it, of, of its MPs, and I'm sure some, whether it's in the current Parliament or past ones, would have fallen foul of this section of the Constitution. And I, I agree with Simon, we live in a um, much more globalised world. Australia's a multicultural country. We've got public servants in it too. I think that section of the Constitution. Uh, um, never waste a good crisis. And uh, this, is, this crisis is an opportunity to, to, ch to chart some long-term structural reform. But the government has bungled it badly. I mean, really, um, the Senator Parry fiasco and the, the fighting amongst the Nationals and the Liberals jockeying for the Senate presidency before Parry had even gone just made it look even worse. The fact that um, Barnaby Joyce stayed as a minister, even though he shouldn't have, the Matt, Matt Canavan left as a minister, even though the High Court has now found he could have stayed, it's all looked uh, very messy. But it's not too late to use the crisis as an opportunity and start selling the case for longer term uh, needed uh, constitutional reform. Let's turn from uh, Canberra and the High Court to Queensland and the election. Galaxy poll out today. Not really good news for either of the major parties, although less awkward for Labor. Labor polling 35%, which is where it was two months ago. The LNP, though, dropping 36 to 32. And at the same time, One Nation up from 15 to 18. Simon... Uh, it does suggest that it's going to be very difficult for either of the major parties to gain a majority in the Queensland Parliament. Labor might be slightly better positioned than the Coalition, or than the LNP, I should say, but the LNP can really only govern with the support of One Nation, and that brings other problems with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, this is going to be such a fascinating contest to watch. I think the campaign itself in the lead up to election day is going to be really interesting, but then of course what the ramifications are going to be for the LNP if they are able to form a coalition with One Nation uh, or if uh, Palaszczuk is, uh, is re-elected, Labor's re-elected. Um, 
Uh, what, what I think is going to be fascinating, the, the most interesting thing though to come out of this is what are the, the policies that are going to come from One Nation and, and how much are they going to be in line with what we've seen from Tim Nichols and the LNP? Are they going to be able to form a, a coalition government? Um, if it comes to that after the election, um, if there are significant differences between those two parties, then it will be really fascinating to see how those issues are resolved in the, the ensuing negotiation following the election. But my sense is that the, the LNP may get close enough with One Nation to be able to, to govern. Um, I think that uh, it will be quite tight. but. Um, I think that it's much, much more likely that One Nation forms um, a coalition with uh, the LNP than it is to form a coalition with the Labor Party. And in a scenario where neither of the two major parties look as though they might get across the line in their own right, that will put the LNP in a pretty good position. So um, I'm not sure that polls like the one that we've seen today are quite as bad news as a lot of people might make them out to be for Tim Nichols and the LNP. It might in end up being a good scenario for them. The problem, of course, is going to be those negotiations and whether they're able to put together a stable government for the next four years.